Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Um, we're, we're really grateful for your presence. Thank you so much for signing up for this stellar talk. Um, we have with us Adam Wagner and Penelope Gibst today, and we're very grateful for them to have decided to spend their next one hour with us talking to us about COVID, criminal justice, and human rights. Adam and Penelope need no introduction. They're absolute stars in the world of criminal justice and, and human rights. Uh, but um, I will say something briefly about both of them. Uh, and, and then we will have about 20 minutes for each of them to give us a snapshot of uh, both of their talks. Uh, we have an interesting mix of uh, thinking about access to justice, especially criminal justice, which seems to have been diminished during COVID, but also thinking about criminal law more broadly in terms of how it's been uh, used and invoked uh, to, to breach human rights. So criminal law has been extremely present in the last one year, which is interesting given the fact that we, we are in, 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 in a health and healthcare crisis uh, during COVID-19, but the use of criminal law has been such a significant tool, it's not just from uh, the criminal justice angle, but also as, as a tool for, for governance. So we'll be interest, interesting, interested to hear on, on both of those aspects, first from Penelope and Adam. But before we hear that, uh, I'd like to introduce both of them briefly to you. Um, Adam Wagner is a barrister at Doughty Street Chambers. Uh, it's one of the top sets doing excellent work in, in, in human rights. Um, Adam is also visiting professor of law at Goldsmiths um, and has been, especially this last one year, the special advisor to the Joint Committee on Human Rights and has been advising on uh, COVID-19 related human rights issues of government policies and, and, and has been representing on a number of challenges um, to the COVID regulations. Adam has also represented uh, the university and college union. So big, big shout out and thanks uh, for all the work uh, on, on that, really appreciate it. Um, and, and we really look forward to hearing from Adam today about um, how criminal law has been used as a tool um, in uh, governance and, and what the human rights implications of, of that have, have been this, this last one year during um, the COVID-19 pandemic. Penelope Gibbs uh, is, is a visiting uh, fellow at Kellogg College. Thank you so much for choosing us, Penelope. Um, Penelope has had a, a long career at uh, BBC with radio production, but then she uh, set up the voluntary action media unit at Time Bank before joining Prison Reform Trust, um, and then took up in 2012 setting up um, what what we know today as Transform Justice, which is a charity which is advocating better justice system in England and Wales. Uh, thank you so much, Penelope, for your fantastic work on that. And we'd be so happy to hear about your ongoing work during the last one year um, as, as well. So uh, Penelope, I'd like to first invite you for the next 20 minutes or so, um, and then uh, Adam would be speaking to us. We would be having about 10, 15 minutes left for Q&A. We have quite a few of us on the call today, so we would like to reserve as much time from everyone. Um, it would be really helpful if, if you have a question, please um, reserve that until the end of the talk. So Penelope and Adam are not disturbed while they're talking, but please do send it using the Q&A box in the end after the talks. Or if you're happy, please do turn on your video and your audio and please ask a the question live, whichever you're comfortable with, but we're very happy to take questions from you after both Penelope and Adam have spoken. But first, Penelope, the floor is yours. Hi, and welcome to everyone. Um, I'd like to start with a quote from a defence lawyer. On those occasions when the video link works, we have very limited time. We often use a lot of it shouting for the custody staff at the other end to hear us and speak to us. When the defendant is produced on the other end, he seems remote. And I often find I can't be sure if he understands my empathy or sympathy or other emotions, which are essential to cultivating a working relationship in this very difficult circumstance. We have stilted conversations, which are often interrupted by delay in transmission or poor connection. 
I find video links an insult to the justice system. Now that testimony was actually from 2017, so way before the pandemic. So why am I talking about, crim rem about remote justice in COVID times? I'm not a trained lawyer or academic, but a campaigner who almost fell into researching the subject five years ago. My charity, Transform Justice, advocates for a fairer, more humane, effective and open justice system. My knowledge of remote justice comes from England and Wales. From our primary research, surveying and talking to lawyers, judges and court staff, from observing courts and from reading official documents and other research. We've published one report, many blogs, a number of submissions to parliamentary committees and umpteen tweets on remote criminal justice. Today, I'll sketch out the history of remote criminal justice in England and Wales, the impact of COVID-19 on it, and what we know about the impact of being remote on suspects and defendants. I'm afraid I won't really touch on witnesses because it's not my expertise. This story of remote justice in England and Wales started a long time ago. So in 1992, the court service and the prison service first tried linking a prison and a court by video. So prisoners wouldn't have to be transported many miles for a short court hearing. Then five years later in 1999, the government commissioned an evaluation by which time there were several video linked prisons. This evaluation was positive overall but there was no reliable finding on justice outcomes and no one actually observed defendants appearing remotely in real time. So they didn't discover how remote affects behavior either of defendants or those still in the court. On the ba basis of this evaluation, the government went ahead to set up prison to court video links nationwide for prisoners to take part remotely in all kinds of hearings apart from trials. So this use of prison to court video links actually expanded even pre-COVID. They began to be used for sentencing hearings, an increasing number of remand hearings, but still they weren't used for trials. And in, then in 2009, a bright spark, and there were always enthusiasts for video hearings, suggested that these remote hearings should be tried out in a new context by setting up video links from police station custody to the magistrate's court. So in England and Wales, most su suspects arrested and detained in police custody are in fact released on bail before their first court appearance but a minority are remanded by the police and kept in custody until their court appearance. And then at this first court appearance, pleas are taken guilty or not guilty. And if the defendant pleads guilty, they might be sentenced on the spot to imprisonment or to other penalties. If awaiting trial, they might be remanded or given bail. So we're talking about a really important court appearance. So normally these detained defendants appeared in person in the court, albeit in the secure dock. They would have been transported in a secure van from police custody to the court, met the lawyer in court cells and given instructions uh, there, or the, rather the suspect gave instructions there. The new idea was for defendants to stay in police custody and be linked by video to the court with the lawyer advocating either from police custody or from the court. They did a pilot in 2000, but it had poor outcomes, uh, particularly on the cost front. Nevertheless, as previously, the flame of enthusiasm was not extinguished. And the judiciary and the government launched a massive digital court reform program, 1.2 billion in 2015, 
And what they wanted to do was significantly increase the use of online and virtual court processes across all jurisdictions. So many proponents of court reform, such as Professor Siskind, say the driver for the programme was or should have been access to justice rather than efficiency. But a document I took two years to obtain via Freedom of Information suggests that the motivation for the government was always cost saving. Uh, so the government commissioned the Boston Consulting Group in 2016 and they, BCG, warned that reforms are framed around efficiency and proportionality, not policy or broader social benefits. Fast forward to 2020. Millions of pounds had by that time been spent by the court service on consultants, software, and extra staff to, you know, to promote this digital court reform program before the pandemic hit. So were criminal courts ready to go online? No, not really. But last spring they went ahead anyway. Now little was done entirely remotely, but what they did do is increase the number of parties being beamed into the courts. Defence and prosecution lawyers throughout the country were allowed to appear on video from wherever, home, office, sometimes their car. And then these police custody suites, from having a couple of pilots where police custody was linked to the court, it went nationwide. And the police set up makeshift systems, usually just a laptop, so they could host defendants for their first court appearance. These were hybrid courts where the judge and court staff continued to appear physically in the court. So these first appearances of defendants at the beginning of pandemic were practically the only criminal court hearings which were done at all. And then they started out magistrates court trials and then crown court trials. And by the way, magistrate court trials were allowed to be wholly uh, video if they wanted, which didn't actually happen, but, but was in legislation. So what do we know about criminal justice during the pandemic and how it might have been affected by these video links? Unfortunately, way too little, but I have some thoughts because I observed courts during peak pandemic uh, last spring, and I've also picked up testimony from practitioners and research. First of all, I'll focus on something which has got very little attention, the pre-hearing relationship between suspect and defendant. And this has been revolutionized by the pandemic. So in England and Wales, suspects de detained in police custody have a right to a legally aided and trained representative to support them before and during their interview with the police. Pre-pandemic, these legal re representatives always went into police custody to meet their client before the interview um, so that they could discuss the case. Suspects detained by the police are inevitably stressed and so vulnerable, and they're often meeting their lawyer for the first time. The lawyer helps them understand the process, ensures that their legal rights are respected, they may spot their client has disabilities, which the police and the suspect themselves have not realized. And that lawyer will fight tooth and nail to prevent their client being detained in custody any longer than necessary. But the pandemic has changed this relationship. And here the remote bit is the lawyers going remote. So lawyers were very concerned about the COVID safety of police custody they felt that there was a lack of social distancing and of PPE. And so they were allowed to give advice remotely from home, either on the phone or on video. It has to be said, everyone was con concerned, was consulted about this new arrangement apart from suspects themselves. But we've gained some insight into the closed world of custody in the pandemic. We've done a survey with NAN, a charity that supports appropriate adults or AAs, volunteers who go into custody to support vulnerable suspects and their legal rights. 
We asked AAs about their experiences supporting suspects whose lawyers were not physically with them, since AAs were in fact there physically. The survey responses were concerning. For a start, in many cases, the suspects weren't asked whether they consented to their lawyer giving advice remotely. Um, they also, in some cases, appeared to feel under pressure to consent. So an AA said, suspects think that they don't matter and have said, the lawyer will be horrible to me if I make them come to the police station. The problem with not seeking consent or with a suspect feeling pressurized could then manifest itself in the actual interview as told to us by another AA who said, on a number of occasions, the suspect and myself have requested for the solicitor to attend each time this has been refused. On approximately nine occasions, the interviews have had to be stopped because the suspect was angry at the solicitor and felt they should be there. I'm sure remote advice works fine a lot of the time, but the problem is there's no empirical evidence and no unmediated suspect te testimony. Even we didn't get that. We got the appropriate adults testimony of suspect's experience. So having been charged, suspects then have to face that first court appearance. And we have a lot of testimony about the difficulties faced by defendants in communicating with their lawyers before that court hearing. So even back in 2017, the lawyers were very concerned about the circumstances of remote consultation before hearings. There were considerable technical problems as there still are. There was insufficient time to talk to clients. So we're talking lawyers being given sometimes less than 10 minutes to introduce themselves to somebody they'd never met in their life before, to understand the case, to talk about the evidence, to assess what disabilities the client might, ha might have, and to give good advice to client on how to plead. So that's a lot in less than 10 minutes. And lawyers often didn't have confidence in the confidentiality of video linked consultations. And that has been an issue during the pandemic as well. So also during the hearing, there's a, a effective participation issue, which is that defendants on a video are less likely to be able to interject their views because they're on a video disconnected from the court and they certainly can't communicate privately with their lawyer during the hearing. They've got to ask for basically the hearing to be totally stopped in order for them to kind of go into a breakout room, talk to their lawyer and come back. And obviously that is a psychological barrier to trying to communicate privately with your lawyer. If you're in custody, you can't WhatsApp your lawyer because you haven't got a phone or any means to do it. So any problems there were pre-COVID with virtual justice have been amplified by measures taken in the last year. Um, so you've got these police custody hearings nationwide. I've observed those, the ability to see the suspect are poor, the uh, audibility is often bad with a distorted sound. In addition to which there are open justice issues. So during the pandemic, it was really difficult to get access to courts at all. So I turned up physically, I'm a very persistent person and I wouldn't take no for an answer, but it was very, very difficult to get access. And also many courts banned members of the public from observing online, which is technically absolutely straightforward. So what I would say about uh, these video links in the pandemic is that what seemed to happen was that they were, almost ineffective hearing some of the time. So in one case, I saw a woman defendant appeared on video from police custody. Her lawyer was on a different video screen, but literally no one, including the police, seemed to know why she'd been detained or what offense she was accused of. 
We waited and waited as the lawyers and legal advisor tried to work it out before the judge understandably lost patience and broke for lunch, leaving the poor woman still in custody. In another case, the judge asked the defense lawyer whether the figure on the video screen was his client. The lawyer said he didn't know since he had never actually seen his client, just had a couple of minutes phone conversation. Now that defendant had serious mental health problems. So what I observed chimed with previous research on criminal video hearings. There've been two independent studies, one in 2010 and the other in 2020. And both of those throw light on the effect, the negative effect of video hearings. Um, so the researchers in the second study, which is called the VEJ study, found some evidence that defendants may be less engaged in video court hearings when the outcome is delivered, more likely to be passive or expressionless. And that resonated with Transform Justice's own research, which suggested from the testimony of lawyers that the disconnection from the court often causes a defendant to tune out, which clearly is not about effective participation. Alternatively, disconnection could lead to defendants becoming frustrated, partly because they found it hard to communicate and partly because they were divorced from the formality of the courtroom. So a lawyer said that some defendants, they kick off and they're rude and they almost certainly wouldn't do that if they're actually there in person. And the other findings that come out of both research reports are about the effect on uh, prison sentences and on legal representation. So in both cases, it appeared that those on video were less likely to take up uh, to be legally represented. We don't know why, but it seemed to be the case. There seemed to be some barrier to taking up legal representation. And the other finding, which is purely indicative is that in both studies, so I said on these first appearances, people could be sentenced on the spot, sometimes to imprisonment. Both these studies showed um, that the, those on video were more likely to be sentenced on uh, to, to prison than those who were in the physical court. So neither of these studies prove that video produces more punitive outcomes. But the suggestion is there and we need to bottom that out before we proceed with more video links, which is what the government would like to do. So just to kind of press ahead to where we are at the moment, which is that the government has got um, the PCSC bill coming up uh, in Parliament. It's just about to be at what's called um, committee stage in the Commons. And what they've done there is they've taken all the Coronavirus Act legislation on video hearings, which was emergency legislation, went through without any real debate about those video hearings and said, it's just going to be made permanent. So no consultation whatsoever on that. And they've even extending it to say that they think that in jury trials, the jury should be able to, to watch the whole trial and participate on video, which is completely new and untried in this country. And they've simply put it in this bill. On human rights, uh, the video links issue is interesting. ECHR says it's not actually in, incompatible with the notion of a fair and public hearing, but it must be done without technical impediments. The suspect must be able to follow it and effective and confidential communication with a lawyer has to be provided for. And I think you can tell from everything I've said today that there are huge doubts about the way video links as practice for defendants and suspects in this country are actually compliant with that ECHR Article 6 guidance. And I'm going to stop there because Adam has got fantastic things to say as well. 
Thank you so much, Penelope. Adam. Thanks, Penelope. Um, and, and thanks so much for having me here. Um, the Kellogg College and also the Oxford Human Rights Hub. Um, I'm really delighted to, to be here with all of you. Um, and thanks so much, Penelope, for your um, extraordinarily important work. Um, and much of it slogging away in areas that people are only sort of, you know, occasionally interested in when it, when it comes into the news. But it's as someone who works in the justice system and has had to shift to this um, online working mode, um, although not, not, not mo mostly not in the criminal justice system it really has made the biggest difference to our um, justice system, you know, almost as a, 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 you know, it's in a, in a moment um, than anything that's come up in my career. I, I'm not gonna talk about the um, online justice. I'm gonna talk about um, the right to protest. And, and I think there's, uh, I, I, I've spent a lot of time working on COVID related issues. Um, as Shreya mentioned at the beginning of this, um, I, I've worked with the Joint Committee on Human Rights for the past year as their specialist advisor. I think we've worked on five reports together um, in all, all different aspects of COVID um, and the, the law relating these, these criminal laws, regulations, all of them secondary legislation, um, so not primary legislation, which have created the, the most draconian and the most extreme restrictions on our everyday lives and really in the history of the criminal law I, I've no doubt about that in, in this country at least there's never been criminal laws like this that, that stop us leaving the home stop us gathering stop us going to concerts stop us even meeting up with our um, with our life partners that we don't live with indoors um, all of these have become criminal offenses um, and one question which has constantly occurred to me um, on, on a regular basis as I've been dealing with lots of different cases in lots of different areas is what happens in a supposedly liberal democratic society when some basic right is taken away and, and not just taken away from a few people but taken away from, from everyone all at once. And in, in a sort of peaceful democracy, um, we, we tend not to have to even ask that question, except theoretically in universities amongst academics, you know, what would happen if these sort of strange count counterfactuals and strange theoretical questions, and they're usually dismissed by lawyers as um, academic in the sense that, that unfortunately that's used in the, in, the, in the English legal system as a pejorative term. Um, but it, but it's not been pejorative to think about these issues during this pa this pandemic, and and one example is well what what happens when the right to protest outdoors with other people is taken away, um, and that has happened. I mean that's not a theoretical question. That has happened for the majority of this year. It appears that protest, any kind of protest of more than one person, in fact, oftentimes of one person and more, um, has been a criminal offence has amounted to a criminal offence and during the lockdowns um, and particularly during the first lockdown and the third lockdown there's been three lockdowns um, basically March to the end of May then um, November um, to the early early December and then January to um, the end of March of this year and during lockdowns one and three the police undoubtedly treated the rights protest as being um, completely abridged so um, so protest has been totally banned um, and they have, in many cases, arrested, given fixed penalty notices to um, used, re used force to um, dissipate um, people who have been protesting peacefully, um, with no violence, but peacefully. Um, but they, they, it's been found to be um, unlawful. What happens when, when that occurs in our, criminal justice, in, our, in our criminal justice system? And the answer, it seems, is, is not very much. Um, and, and, and I say that with, with some experience, and I'm going to explain why, um, and I'm going to try and tease out why I think that's so worrying. I'm just going to share my screen and show you um, what I hope um, you will be able to see in a moment, which is my COVID regulations table. Can you see that, or am I sharing some private work that I'm doing at the moment? Does it, does it look like, yes, thumbs up, good. <laughs> it's, always, it's always a bit of a bit of a... Um, a hairy moment when you share a screen um, during one of these things. So, so this is my 
table of COVID lockdown regulations. And, and all I'm going to show you is the fact that there are many, many, many of them. I, I've got to, uh, if you go all the way down to the bottom, I've got to number 71. Um, and there's actually been more than that because I've not covered all the travel regulations. And you'll see that I've, I've color coded them. And the dark green ones and the light green ones are national regulations. The blue ones are local regulations. So um, lockdowns imposed on particular areas and the um, and, and other colors do things like travel and, and face coverings, that sort of thing. And, and you'll see from the, from the colors that the, for the first bit of this crisis, the government used national regulations. And then for a bit in the middle, it tried to impose lots of different rules for different areas. And then towards the end, more recently, it got rid of the idea of doing local regulations and did everything nationally again. The other thing I wanted to, to show you is what some of these regulations look like. Now, so just to explain, each of these regulations is a law. Um, and each of these regulations is secondary legislation. And what that means is rather than a, a piece of primary legislation being sent through parliament, being voted on by different houses, being debated, being amended, going through committees, all of these regulations have been passed without the need for any prior debate. So, and I'll show you an example. Um, in fact, I'm sharing the wrong, um, it doesn't matter, I'll, I'll just do this, right? So. This is the, the first set of lockdown regulations, 20, um, no, in fact, let's do this one. This was the first set of lockdown regulations made at 1 p.m. on the 26th of March, 2020, laid before parliament an hour and a half later, coming into force uh, b before being laid before parliament. And, and the reason that that can happen is because the Secretary of State has a power under the Public Health Control of Disease Act 1984, which allows him to do this. And it's always, almost always been Matt Hancock who has um, signed these regulations. And what it means is quite literally, the minister signs the regulations and at the very moment he signs them, they come into, they come into our law. And potentially at the very minute, as in this case, they come into force. Um, the other thing to show you about the first set of lockdown regulations is they were pretty short. So if you go to the bottom, there were 10 pages plus the explanatory notes. Um, and that was how the first lockdown, which was enforced, it was, you know, you couldn't leave your house, you couldn't gather in public places and you um, and businesses had to shut. And it was done in 11 pages. By contrast, if you look to the, the most recent regulations, so the ones that are enforced now, the steps regulations, um, here you have a contents page and I won't, take you all the way through them, but you can see there are close to 100 pages of regulations. Um, and, and in fact, the, 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 they've, they've often exceeded 100 pages. And the government's tried out lots and lots of different ways of doing the lockdown. They've changed the law on average every five days over the course of the last year and a bit. Um, and it's all done by secondary legislation. And one of the things that, it, 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 that has been done through these regulations is banning gatherings of more than um, often more than one person or more than two people outside. Um, now, on occasion, there has been an explicit exception for the right to protest. Um, it's roughly, I think, over the course of about probably three months, there has been an exception for protest, maybe four um, in these regulations. So where you can see that is in, I'll show it you briefly, it's in the all tiers regulations. Um, and we can see exception 14, a gathering is for the purpose of protest and it's been organized by a business, charitable, benevolent or philanthropic organization, a public body or a political body. And the gathering organizer takes the required precautions in relation to the gathering and required precautions are um, following social distancing guideline, guidelines and, and the like. Over the course of the um, of the lockdown from the beginning of January to the end of March, there was no protest exception. And what that meant was the police um, interpreted that as there being no right to protest in effect, because they interpreted that as, as meaning that protest was banned outdoors. And that's how they, and they acted accordingly. Um, now, my view is that position is legally wrong. And in fact, um, we, we, the, there are now two court judgments, one in a case called Dolan and the other in a case um, involving the reclaimed these streets 
protests or vigil um, after the, the murder of Sarah, um, alleged murder of Sarah Everard, um, that both say that under these regulations, protest is not completely banned because there is what's called a reasonable excuse as a defense in criminal law to, um, to the restrictions. And that reasonable excuse must, these two court judgments have said, include, incorporate the right to protest, which is protected not by secondary, but by primary legislation. It's the Human Rights Act 1998, and it includes a specific right to protest. Um, this issue came into a very, very sharp relief um, for, um, for a, a group of women who organized, who were trying to organize a vigil after the death of Sarah Everard. Um, and the, um, th this all became a big a national issue because as you'll probably remember, um, it only happened about six weeks ago, there were stories um, in the newspaper, on the front page of all the newspapers and photos of women ultimately being dragged off a, um, off a bandstand in Clapham Common because they were um, they refused to budge, um, and they were they they were what, what they were as they saw it, exercising their lawful rights to freedom of expression and freedom of association. Now, how did we get to that stage? Um, well, I'll tell you the story briefly of, of how I came to be involved in, in this case. So, on the the Wednesday before the Saturday, I think it was the 12th of March, possibly, or sometime around then. Um, the, the four women, um, all um, labour activists of um, different um, different um, affiliations, a couple of counts, local councillors um, and two others, decided that because of this shocking um, death of Sarah Everard, they would um, uh, try and bring together women in a large vigil um, in, at Clapham Common where um, Sarah Everard was see, was was were her local area and where she was seen walking just before she died. They thought they would bring together women in a socially distanced, silent vigil um, to not just um, remember Sarah Everard, but also stand up for the rights of women to be able to go um, to to walk, sim quite simply walk um, where they want out in public places without the um, the risk of violence. And they. Um, being, you know, the the sort of um, the, the kind the, the, in the kinds of positions they were, immediately started working with the local council, Lambeth Council, to try and arrange a um, a safe COVID safe vigil. And Lambeth Council were very um, initially very supportive, as were the local police, and they said, "Oh, we'll provide COVID marshals." And they were starting to figure out ways of um, making this COVID safe. And, and in fact, the, the risk of outdoor transmission from COVID in a socially distanced um, gathering is, is, is extremely low and it's never been a, a priority of SAGE advising the government. Um, but on, on, on the Thursday, so that was the Wednesday, on the Thursday morning, it started to look like the police, the Met Police in particular, were not going to allow this uh, because as far as they were concerned, any kind of gathering of this kind of any uh, exercising these kind of um, rights would be unlawful under the regulations. And that's what they told um, the women. Now, I tweeted out um, that if any of the women around the country were organizing these vigils, because it had spread and it become a very big deal. And a lot of women were trying to organize similar vigils in other, in other places, um, needed help with the legal side, then, then give me a call, which quite a few of them did. And as it happened, we, um, I was al already meeting with a group, an online meeting with a group of lawyers who had been working on another similar kind of protest case. So we already had the issue in our minds. We'd already th thought about it quite carefully about what we thought the police were getting wrong. And in fact, we still already had the police policy, which we thought was unlawful, we still think is unlawful. And um, we very quickly over the course of, uh, I guess, 24 hours, put together a legal challenge to the approach the Metropolitan Police were taking. And by Friday afternoon, we were in court um, online, um, as Penelope will be interested to hear, but it was an online hearing um, in front of Mr. Justice Holgate. And Mr. Justice Holgate um, was asked to rule that the, um, the approach the police were taking was unlawful. Effectively, they can't ban protest. 
Um, and the police turned up in court, said, well, actually, we're not banning protest. We don't think protest is unlawful per se. It's not unlawful without more. Um, it, you know, so there's no need for you to make an order. And the judge eventually made, uh, made a ruling that any application of a blanket policy which would prevent the rights, which would completely prevent protests would be unlawful. I'll just show you the, um, since I'm still scared, sharing my screen, I'll show you the, the ruling. Um, here it was all done at very significant speed. There it is, the 12th of March. Um, this was probably 24 hours after we issued the application. And you can see, um, you can see the, the, the relevant part really is where it says, um, Mr. Hickman, who's the QC um, on our side, also submits correctly, it's inappropriate to treat the 2020 regulations as if they give rise to a blanket prohibition on gatherings for protest, because that would fail to give effect to the law as laid down by the Court of Appeal in Dolan and the way in which the regulations are to be read and applied compatibly with Articles 10 and 11 of the Human Rights Act. Um, so you would hope that the police then would take a different line they'd been taking and say, well, look, how are we going to organize a COVID safe protest that would be um, compatible with your right to protest and be safe? Because the point of these regulations is not to ban protest, it's to protect people from, people from COVID. That's the only point of these regulations. Um, but in fact, after the hearing, and, and we met with the police after the hearing, they, they dug their heels in and said, well, we're not going to allow this. There's no form of this protest, that of this vigil which would be um, lawful, and that's the end of it. Um, so uh, unfortunately, my four clients um, had to pull out. They decided not to attend them. So, um, not, they decided to cancel the version of the vigil that they were planning. Um, and what ended up happening happened. But I think just before I finish, I, I just want to say a couple of things about, about what I think um, this all shows. The, the first thing is, um, it, it's, it's difficult to describe um, how difficult it is to bring a public law challenge, um, and particularly one in a controversial area of law, um, and COVID cases are, are particularly controversial. In, in order to bring one, you first of all, you know, you, you've got to have so many ducks in a row that you, you're practically, you know, at a fun fair, at the, you know, the, the shoot a duck stand. I know it's, it's a terrible metaphor, but you get my point. You have to first of all have clients who are going to want to pursue the case. Second of all, you're going to need the right kind of facts that are going to attract a judge. And, I'd, and, and unfortunately, you know, the, the, the judicial system is, is, is just as, you know, it's, it's not an objective system, it's not a purely objective system. They are, you, you, you hit against the prejudices and the expectations of the judge that you get. Um, you have to get the right judge and, and certain judges are just going to be more amenable to certain kinds of cases than others, and it's a lottery. You've got to have enough money um, and this is an absolute massive impediment in most cases. One of the reasons that we couldn't, the, the, the case we were working on originally just wasn't getting off the ground is just because we couldn't figure out a way to fund it. Um, you, you might not believe this, but to bring a public law case and to protect your clients from costs and so from having to pay the, the other side, the, the, the central government's costs. And often they'll have, you know, a couple of, might have a couple of QCs, three junior barristers, a load of solicitors. So could be in the tens of thousands generally you have to raise something like a hundred thousand pounds. Um, so only in the most um, the most unusual case will you be able to raise that kind of money, or you might have legal aid, in which case um, that, that good for you, but legal aid is so rare these days, it's so difficult to get, um, that it's it just becomes almost impossible to get these cases out there. Um, I, I find it extraordinary that there, there was an insurance case um, that got to the Supreme Court in the summer, um, or in the autumn, I think, which related to COVID, in, in the, the effect of COVID business interruption, I think it was on, you know, uh, COVID on business interruption insurance policies. And, and I read the judgment and, and the beginning, well, I read the beginning of the judgment and the beginning of the judgment said, this, judgment, this um, case is brought under a test case scheme that's set out in legislation that allows people to, it allows cases to be brought that don't have a particular claimant, but that raise an important issue of law relating to insurance. Um, and I just find it amazing that you don't have that in human rights law, that you can't bring a case um, on an important issue that needs to be resolved, ho um, ideally on a cost neutral basis or some sort of cost protective basis 
that you have to find the perfect client, you have to find the perfect, the amount of money, that it has to all happen before the thing becomes academic. And again, that's that word um, that's seen as pejorative. Um, and I think where, where I've come to is that in it's, it might be that retrospectively, and we're, we're still pursuing this case, that the court reaches the right decision and everybody um, you know, understands what the law should have been. But the reality is that unless you are incredibly for, fortunate um, and also unless everything goes, yeah, well, everything goes right for you, it's almost impossible to, in an urgent situation, get the results um, of, you know, of the court really getting to grips with what the law sh should be um, and resolving an urgent situation because ultimately th the system is just not set up for that. And I think we've really seen that in the COVID, um, the last year of COVID, that if the government decides to change the law every few days on average, and the laws are incredibly complicated, and they have these unbelievably serious effects, it's just almost impossible to, um, to resolve that, it, to, to get some sort of resolution in the courts. And, um, it, it, you know, whether that could, whether there's some sort of systemic change that could be affected to solve that, I don't know. But um, I, I'm fairly certain that if you're going to want, if you're going to challenge these things, it has to be done in Parliament because the courts are not going to come to the rescue. Um, I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, Adam, Penelope, um, for those fascinating talks, but more importantly, for the work that you're doing defending human rights uh, during this time, especially at a time when the Human Rights Act itself is under threat. So it's a really big thanks to you both for, for your defense of Article 6, Article 10, and Article 11. Uh, they're so important in the catalog of rights which matter. Thank you so much. We do have about 10 minutes for questions. So I, may I invite um, those of you who would like to ask any question from the audience, um, either drop your question in the chat box, we'll be able to pick that up. Or if you'd like to raise your digital hand, please do. And you can unmute yourself um, and put your video on if you'd like. Um, I wonder if I can I can start us off um, until people post something. Penelope, I have a question for you. I was wondering, what role has an, the economic argument played in this acceleration towards online justice? So criminal justice system is, is cash strapped. And I wonder if this was seen as an opportunity to really cut costs and and and, and, and somehow save money um, and, and somehow cement this for the future, that this will be the way the criminal justice system can, can spend less and, and do more. I wonder if that, that argument had, had any relevance in, in how things have gone on in the last one year. It's total and utter relevance, but, but interestingly, uh, I think that nobody's actually done the sums properly so I think people instinctively believe that if you put everything online and on video and close all the courts, it would end up being cheaper. But they didn't really have a good evidence base. And it's interesting the 2010 study I mentioned, which was a pilot of these police custody into magistrates court links, they actually said, forget it. It really, you know, it, it's more expensive. So forget it now. But, but what I found is, is I think that never underestimate how enthusiasm for technology can kind of just be a, a, a kind of barrier to, to rational thinking. And my feeling is that I'm not at all sure it's cheaper. And one of the reasons why I'm not at all sure it's cheaper is that if the end result is say more people going to prison or more people on remand or whatever, then that's expensive. But nobody's looked, nobody, for, for the first point, nobody's got the data to say whether it makes these differences to justice outcomes. But if it does, then any tiny savings you've made on closing a court here or there 
are completely, you know, kiboshed by the fact that you've got more people in prison, which is very, very expensive. Um, and the other thing is that's come through in the pandemic, and I think it's very interesting and very little spoken about, is that at the moment, putting all these hearings, hybrid hearings online is slowing everything down in the criminal courts. So the Lord Chief Justice put out a pronouncement which caused huge uh, concern uh, in March, I think, saying he wanted all the lawyers to come back into court because they're concerned about COVID still and they want to work remotely. He said, come back into courts because we have found that the courts are too slow if you put everybody online. So if they're slower online, and also you've got to keep the physical court still running because some people are still there, then they're probably more expensive. Um, and actually for nerds who like that kind of stuff, the National Audit Office is very, very skeptical about the cost saving involved in putting everything online or on video. I think there's a question in the chat for Adam. Yeah. Thanks so much, Penelope. I have to say, uh, everything that you're talking about online justice seems to apply to online teaching, and we must make that analogy at some point and, and talk about that as well. Um, so I, I have two questions in chat, and I know Tara has her hand up. Um, I'll, I'll ask a quick question to, to Adam before I turn to the audience. If others have a question, please please do um, raise your hand or, or, or drop a or line in the chat box. Um, Adam, I, I just wondered um, instinctively what you think where this this clapdown on the right to protest is coming from. Is it a general uh, anti-democratic move or is it a specific anti-democratic move? Is it something quite specifically about minorities who are claiming the right to protest? And is, is it directed towards um, women's rights, uh, climate change protesters? Um, against the way the BLM protests have been carried out, the way Roads Must Fall protests have been. Is it quite specific anti-democratic concern or is it just this general sense of um, trying to, to, to cut uh, the, 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 the long history of right to protest in, in, in this country? Um, my best guess, um, and in fact, I'm, I'm fairly sure this is correct, is that this has um, been an opportunity to reduce, you know, um, uh, voices opposing the government, and particularly the, the the three. I think you've mentioned the three key movements, which was Extinction Rebellion, which has really caused this government a lot of headaches, and they were, and, and also the Metropolitan Police. Um, because they're very smart and because they're very good at, um, you know, at um, working within the law, which you know protects peaceful protest and always has and always sh and should, um, although with with some limits. I think Extinction Rebellion, uh, Black Lives Matter, and the and the statue, um, the Rose Must Fall, the you know the Bristol statue um, protest. You know that they are. It, it, there's a general sort of culture war kind of aspect to it. Um, and I think there's been, my, my worry is that the general politics of human rights is that even advocates for human rights have fallen into a, a mode of thinking that we've just got to protect what we have. Um, and in actual fact, what we have is not strong enough in, in my view. And we've, we've been prevented from having a really important discussion about how, what could be, what could the Human Rights Act do better? What could be done to improve it? I think one of the obvious, points for me now is that it's too expensive to bring judicial review and human rights cases. I think that limits the availability of human rights, um, of, 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 bring, of, of bringing a human rights claim in the courts to only a, you know, a limited number of people, but, but also increases the, the it, 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 it focuses attention too much on the lawyers because the lawyers are it's the kind of campaigning lawyers who, you know, are quite a small group of people who are bound to pick the the causes which they um, which they identify with, 
and it, you know, and it creates a sort of uh, a, an easy target for the government. Um, and the reason I think the reason I mentioned the lawyers, and I you know I include myself in this, is that it's so difficult to bring a case that you you really need to go to. There's only a very limited number of legal firms that can do it, and that can understand you know crowdfunding and legal aid and all that kind of thing. Um, or, and, and there's only you know, or then you have the sort of um, the good law project type approach, which is a you know purely well, almost purely p political. It's quite politicized approach to um, you know public law. And I think that the I'm increasingly of the view that, that there needs to be much a much more democratized um, approach to the court system. Um, it's not not reducing down. The, the answer isn't reducing down the number of claims it's it's in a way it's increasing the number of claims and making them easier to bring so that the good ones can come through because otherwise you just you know um you're stuck in a system rather than um getting what you need from it so i think that the i, I didn't i i moved on from the question you asked actually but the point is um it, it's the home office really is, is is driving all this it's been driving it through the pandemic is driving the new the new law is driving the political approach but it can't the home office can't do that without the support of the prime minister um so that that's definitely where it's coming from thanks adam while i have you could i ask dawn's question which is in the chat um, about anti-lockdown protests so the question is are teachers allowed to attend anti-lockdown protests my daughter's teacher has allegedly been sacked for attending one um, oh, it's difficult. Um, the it, it, it's I mean it's an employment law question. It's whether the it's whether now schools are bound by the Equality Act and they've got to you know they've got to also that public authorities are you know are bound by the Human Rights Act. So they've got to be very careful about whether they are acting in a way which you know disproportionately impacts on people's rights, freedom of expression. Um, but if but they will have a discretion within there if they feel that the the school has been brought into disrepute or the or the children are at risk because of the views of the teacher something like that um but i don't know i mean it's anti lockdown yeah you know, there's a whole there's a very broad coalition of people who are anti lockdown ranging from really sort of quite sort of you know mad conspiracists to a you know fair enough people who don't want lockdowns because they feel they've damaged children or, or people's health or whatever. So, I, I mean, it's, it's quite worrying that um, I can see probably, I can imagine how it happened, but I think that teacher hopefully will be talking to our union and trying to figure it out. Thanks, Adam. I see Tara's hand is up. Tara, would you like to turn your video and audio on to ask the question? Um, hi there. Um, thanks both of you for a kind of absolutely fascinating um, kind of coverage of the kind of ge the general impact of COVID um, and quite shocking, actually. Um, it was especially shocking, um, Penelope, to hear that suspects are more likely to be sent to prison um, when their evidence has been heard um, remotely. Um, do you think that there is the potential for um, a, an evidence base to be built um, which might tip the balance and actually engage Article 6 at some point? Um, and not just in, for what's in place right now, but for these proposals, for example, for online juries, which is kind of equally worrying. You think that, that that balance might be tipped at some point? The, the fight on online juries is in initially in Parliament because it's a proposal at the moment. And uh, I think many, many people are ranged against it. I do think we need way more strategic litigation about day-to-day -day criminal law and practice, which is not human rights compliant. Um, but not being a lawyer as... I can't do it, but I agree with Adam about the kind of it needs to be democratized somehow that you could you could strategically litigate about these things. I don't know if Adam wants to comment on that. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I just, the cases that get to court are a pretty random sampling of the ca of the cases that need to get to court. You know, there, there are lots of important cases that do get to court and lots of great organizations that have ways of bringing them. But, um, but it is a worry that things like what you've described can be happening um, without, you know, without proper scrutiny. And, and I don't think parliament has really done its job this year, you know, with some exceptions I and mean, the committees have been working pretty well though I would say that um, and, and I think that the courts have a have a important role to play which doesn't have to be interfering or getting too political you know those sorts of things they can it can be you know that, that we were talking just before we started about the use of the single justice procedure um, this you know basically deciding COVID cases COVID um, uh, breaches of COVID regulations where people are getting criminal records um, on the papers. So they're just, you know, a judge going, oh, tick, like they were with a TV license offence. And I think those kind of, when that kind of stuff is happening, you really want someone to pick it up and a judge to pick it up and consider it and think of it as in a systemic way. Um, but it just seems that the barriers to doing that are so large that um, it's, you know, you, in some cases just don't get brought. And just as a kind of supplementary question to that, um, is there a place, for example, for the Law Commission to step in somewhere to say that this is actually potentially a barrier to justice, how these proposals might impact on um, the way that justice is carried out? As a campaigner, I would say that the routes to, to change are incredibly difficult. And if you can get the Law Commission on your side, that's fantastic. But if you look at the history of the Law Commission, the number of times that government have actually agreed to their recommendation are very, very, very few. So possibly, but then the government can just ignore them. Yeah. Thank you, Penelope. So I see we are at the top of the hour already. And unlike the government, I have no right to detain everyone. So may I ask if, if we can take one more minute and we can throw a last question uh, in for both Penelope and Adam, because they're two interesting questions. If it's all right, we'll, we'll just be a minute. Adam, um, first to you. Uh, this is Sarah's question in, in the chat box and she's drawing a link with um, the potential um, changes to the Human Rights Act um, and perhaps a, a potential withdrawal from the human rights, um, a withdrawal of the withdrawal from the ECHR and repeal of the Human Rights Act. I wonder how much are you concerned about that and um, the power of judges to be reviewing uh, the, the kind of legislation that, that you've been talking about today and the, and the list of the regulations that you showed us today. Um, I, I'm, I'm always worried about what every time this government mentions human rights, it's never with a view to strengthening them. It's always with a view to weakening them. And, um, and I think that there's many in this government who would very happily withdraw from the European Convention on Human Rights, you know, a treaty that we drafted in, in large, in significant proportions and, and which the UK um, was, was the driving force behind. Um, but I don't think, I mean, that's not going to happen to this parliament, at least. But what is going to happen is they're reviewing the Human Rights Act. And I think after a number of years of trying various different ways of weakening the system, I think that the, 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 the way that they've, they've sent, they've, they've reached, the, the solution they've reached is rather than take the rights away, which is going to cause, you know, potentially rebellions within the, within the Conservative Party, just make them harder to access, you know, and that's the that's behind the, that's part of the judicial review um, consultation that's going on as well. There's, 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 there's this feeling in government, just, just like the right, just like people are protesting that, that um, left-wing campaigners are using um, judicial review and human rights to, um, to score points against the government. Um, and that's just, you know, it, it's, it's just such a, a one dimensional way of approaching democracy and the, this amazing, um, this amazing sort of dialogue that happens between the courts and the parliament and the and the um, and the executive in a, in a mature democracy, and just painting that as well. It's all just point scoring. It's all just kind of you know um, stuff that we want to get rid of. In the same way that you know Black Lives Matter is just um, 
you know, a bunch of, um, you know, disgruntled people making problems with the police. It's, it's that, that, that approach is, is just going to damage society, I think, generally, um, and needs to be fought tooth and nail, even if it's boring looking procedural reforms, um, which will just make everything harder in, in, you know, for people to bring cases. Thank you, Adam. Penelope, a final big question to you. This is from Amy. Do you think there could be any benefits, long-term gains from how the courts have conducted hearings over the pandemic? Can I say there's a fantastic website about the Court of Protection um, and uh, a pioneer called Celia Kitzinger, who has uh, encouraged people to watch Court of Protection hearings and she absolutely believes that in that jurisdiction, and I would say it's probably quite unusual, online hearings are much better court of protection hearings. So she would say there are more witnesses, they're listened to better, you have better quality evidence, it's more open to other people. So the possibility for courts being more open is there. And then also there's the possibility, and I'm all for it, of procedural and administrative hearings for lawyers where they don't have to travel halfway across the country to appear for 10 minutes when their uh, client isn't even in the court. So those two things. Thank you so much, Penelope, Adam. Uh, thank you everyone uh, for staying those extra minutes. Um, can I just express my deep gratitude, not just for this talk, but for, for both of you for working on the front lines of defending human rights. This is a very illuminating evening. We really appreciate your time, but we most of all appreciate the work that you're doing. Thank you so much, Penelope. Thank you so much, Adam. And thank you as well from the Oxford Human Rights Hub who've co-hosted this event. Thank you everyone for joining us. Have a good evening. Thank you, bye. Thanks for having us, bye-bye.